chapter 5 and verse 7. Notice ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? So notice right here that Paul was saying that the Galatians at the beginning, they ran very well. But later on, somebody hindered them for them not to obey the truth of the gospel. So remember, as you might recall, there are these Judaizers. Oops, okay who tried to get onto the Galatians here. And then these Galatians, they were doing well. They were running well. Their services were running well. See, that's the idea. And it was running well on the truth of the gospel. But then what happened? These Judaizers were infiltrating the Galatians and they were hindering them. They were hindering them. They are trying to get them back to this system, which is, as you might recall, the Old Testament laws. Remember that? So we covered that quite often right here. So our poor Seventh-day Adventist friends didn't get a break while watching these videos, if there's any of them still watching us. So we see right here that the Galatians They've been enforced by Judaizers to go back over here. And Paul said that they were hindering them. Now, that's the same thing with us. We run well. Bible-believing churches run well. We're doing great. But a lot of times, the devil can set up things in our lives that hinder us. So, <clears throat> you can make this into a really good Christian sermon. So, thus, you hear the term where preachers and Christians talk about the Christian race. Have you heard that kind of term before? We'll talk about the Christian race, the Christian race. So this is one of the verses that you can use to preach concerning about the Christian race. The other one is Hebrews chapter 12. So we're going to look at three passages that refer to the Christian race. Now this is important to know because, in my opinion, the hardest crown you will ever win in heaven is related to this, actually. So you want to pay attention to this one. All right, so let's start off with Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. And then we'll start off at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says right here, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us, notice, run with patience the race that is set before us. So we Christians are running a race. But when you're running a race, like a typical marathon, what do you do? You look at the prize. You don't look at the hardship. You don't look at how much you're panting and you're going to die. You look and you focus on the prize. So look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, uh, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So see, that's what we got to be doing, is that Jesus Christ also ran his race. He completed it by dying on the cross. And we are to follow that example of running as hard as Jesus did. So, in order to not get discouraged during your Christian race, who are you setting your eyes on? Who are you looking at? And then, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth of the gospel, huh? Was it your friends? Got your eyes on them, and that hindered you, and that made you not look at Jesus Christ. Who are you looking at? Your job. That hindered you, and that made you not look at Jesus Christ. See? Here's another passage. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is actually uh, your pastor's lifetime verse right here. So this is my favorite verse. It's 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. So this passage as well talks about the Christian race. So we saw Hebrews 12 demonstrating the Christian race, as well as 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says, I have fought a good fight. I have what? Finished my course. So he finished his running course. I have kept the faith. So we want to act like we accomplished, we finished. 
So it's not finished until you actually finish, until God says it's finished. Can you say this at your deathbed? This is what I want to say. This is what I want to write on my own tombstone. I want to make sure that I completed my race for the Lord. Okay, we're also going to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians 9. Okay, now this is the passage that talks about five crowns. So there are five crowns that you're going to get at the judgment seat of Christ. One of those five crowns is called the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. That incorruptible crown will depend upon your Christian race. All right, let me know if I'm out of bounds on both cameras. Just let me know. Okay, so the incorruptible crown is when you're doing well in your Christian race. So you want to make sure that you get this crown, the incorruptible crown. You might say, how do I get this crown, Pastor? How you get this crown is called temperance. In other words, self-control. Race, marathon, is all about self-control, right? Training yourself, watching what you eat, making sure you keep up with your schedule of running every day, etc. That's the same thing with your Christian race. This is why this is perhaps one of the hardest crowns to win at the judgment seat of Christ because there are times we went out of schedule, haven't we, in our Christian race? We've fallen behind in our Bible reading and prayer. There are things that we ate the wrong kind of food. We weren't watching our diet, our spiritual diet carefully. So we went back to the same old bad habits. See, there's a lot of likening right here. Same old bad habitual sins. Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read verse 24. Know ye not that they which run, a, run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. See that? Temperate means self-control, like self-training. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and what? Incorruptible. That's your incorruptible crown that you get. But how well are you being temperate? How well are you good in self-control? Okay, let's return to our main text, Galatians. Let's return to our main text, Galatians. <clears throat> now let's look at verse 8. <clears throat> this persuasion... Okay, so that term persuasion, you're going to hear it quite often. That term persuasion, it means belief. So you're going to sometimes see that in your red hymnals. You're going to see that later on in the scriptures. Or if you read old English preachers, of what persuasion are you of, etc. When you hear that term, it means uh, what belief. It's kind of like today. What's your denomination? What's your religion? What's your background? So Paul's saying this persuasion, right? So this particular belief, what belief? The Judaizers, getting back to the Old Testament law. This persuasion, so this belief from the Judaizers, cometh not of him that calleth you. That's not from God. So this persuasion from the Judaizers, it is not from God. God did not ordain that. So you can tell your Seventh-day Adventist friend that's not from God, and they'll throw a fit. We keep the Sabbath. No, that's not from God. They'll throw a fit after that. Tell your Hebrew roots friends, the black Hebrew Israelites, and even Jews today, that mandatory observances of Sabbaths, that that is not from God. This persuasion com cometh not of him that calleth you. So this verse says, cometh not of him, God, that calleth you. So God is the one who calls you. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. An infamous doctrine is Calvinism. What is Calvinism? So Calvinism, they're a doctrine where they feel like that God has to call you. God has to call you to get saved. Now, we believe that. God calls us to get saved. But what they think is that when God calls you to get saved, you have no free choice. So then he twists your arm and then you have to get saved. So this depends on calling. So this is a Calvinist doctrine that God calls you to get saved, meaning this is all done by force. 
That's the idea. But it's more simple than you think. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then notice right here what the Word of God says right here in verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now Calvinists, they like to argue this. They like to argue that in order to become a saint or the church, you have to be called of God. So see, it's not of your free will. There's no free will here. So it is not of your free will that you got saved. God had to call you and then you became saved and you became the saint, you became the church. Well, that's just nonsense because look at right here. Who is the church of God at verse 2? Who is the one sanctified in Christ Jesus at verse 2? Who's the one called to be saints at verse 2? It's those who what? Look at the second part of verse 2. Every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. So, this is more simple than you think. If you want to be part of the calling of God who are called to be saints in church, you yourself, free will, have to call upon God for salvation. And then you become the saved saint church and called of God. Well, that's a no-brainer right there, see? So the Calvinists, they get it, they get it the other way around. So that verse is those who call upon Jesus Christ are called of God. They're the saint, they're the church, correct? Who can call upon God? It's anybody. Look at Romans 10, 13. This proves free will. See, God does not call certain people to become saved. And thus they have no free choice about it. No. God wants everyone to be saved. But... They have to, anybody, everybody, who will call upon Jesus Christ for salvation, Amen. they become the called of God to be saints in church. See, that's your answer right there. It's not God calling you to become the saint and the church without a free choice. No, it's I call upon, see, my free choice, my action, by calling upon the name of the Lord for my salvation, then I become the called of God to be sane in church. Amen. So look at Romans 10, 13. So who are the called of God? Those who call upon Jesus Christ, correct? That's 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Then you show your Calvinist friend Romans 10, 13, and then they'll throw a fit. For, for who? The elect? Did it say for the elect call upon the name of the Lord? Or it said whosoever? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, God's not picking and choosing certain people. It's anybody who gets saved. But then James White, because he thinks that he's such a smart aleck and he doesn't even know basic English, he says, no, for the elect who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that what it says? Look at that verse. You all read English? E-L-E-C-T. Do you see that five-letter word in there? No, that, that so-called doctorate doesn't even see that. So he thinks he's smart because he argued 100 debates. Just because you argue doesn't mean you're right, okay? So the thing is this, is that even an intellectual f person can be a fool and a dummy. So it's anybody, everybody who calls upon Jesus Christ becomes called of God. All right? It didn't say certain people. They, they say whosoever of the elect. That's what they insert right there. That's how they get around that one. But that is such, that is such entire nonsense right there. That's ignoring plain, plain English. Because if you look up that word whosoever and all the other places, you're going to find out that it's because they follow a condition out of their free choice. They became the elect in every one of them. That's how you counter argue against them. But that one, you don't have to understand that one. Okay, that's just a technical Calvinist argument. Point is, Romans 10.13, point is this. Romans 10.13, anybody who calls on Jesus Christ, then what happens? They become the call to be saints and church. Capisce?